Welcome to the Cyberpunk 2077 Ultimate Story Spoilers Discussion. I'm Big Dan. Every time I finish a game that I really enjoyed, all I want to do is talk about it with others who've played it as well. So that's what this video is for, a chat for us netrunners who finished Cyberpunk 2077. I'll be talking about the main story, as well as a handful of notable side quests. There are timestamps in the description if you want to skip around to a specific quest or topic. Right out of the gate, this game is just oozing with atmosphere. It feels like Neuromancer or Blade Runner come to life in video game form. I played as a street kid, which opens up the game with V sitting in a CD bar. We're immediately asked to settle the barkeep's debt with a shady fixer in one of the booths. This guy looks like he walked off the set of Boogie Nights, a real dirtbag with bad hair, giving us a job that seems too easy. Walk into a parking garage, get into a car and drive it out. As if anything is ever that simple. Of course, things go south and we meet Jackie Wells, our soon-to-be partner in crime. Right now he's sticking a gun in V's face before the police sweep in on both of us. By a stroke of luck, Jackie and V survive and we're treated to a montage before diving into some of the first missions of the game. We do a quick rescue mission, get some cyberware installed, and finally get some details on the big job for Act 1 the heist that will put V and Jackie on the map. All of the main story missions in Act 1 are bangers. Interesting characters, multiple ways to complete objectives based on playstyle and role-playing preferences. It's grade A stuff. CD Projekt Red also does a great job of setting up the mood and atmosphere with the characters. The first time you meet Dexter Deshaun and Evelyn Parker, you get the sense that these are big-time major players in Night City. Dex is sporting cool shades, gold chains, and is driven around in a fancy car. The guy oozes money and influence. We feel that he can put us on the map and get us hooked up with high-paying gigs. Mind if I ask you something right off the bangle? Would you rather live in peace as Miss Nobody, die ripe, old, and smelling slightly of urine, or go down for all times in a blaze of glory smelling near like posies without seeing your 30th? You're either somebody or you fizzle out into nothing. Night City don't let you choose. Oh, but it does. See, in my line of work, I choose to be Mr. Sure. Chill. But folk who try to take advantage, well, they see the beast inside. And then there's Dex's client, Evelyn Parker. She towers over you when you first meet her. She stands by in her mink coat judging you, literally from on high. She also seems like a wealthy and powerful person a fashionista and tastemaker of sorts. Working with these two makes it feel like V and Jackie are on the verge of breaking the cycle of low-level grifting and stepping into the more lucrative side of organized crime in Night City. But this is all just surface-level stuff. We receive hints that Dex and Evelyn are not all they're cracked up to be. There are rumors of what Dex was doing in the two years he disappeared from Night City, and while Jackie calls him the biggest fixer in NC, it's Rogue who is the one who runs the Afterlife nightclub and seems to garner more respect. And of course, we also don't know right away that Evelyn was not a wealthy tastemaker, but a simple sex worker who was only in the game because she had a connection with Yoronobu Arasaka, heir to one of the wealthiest corps on the planet. The only way she'll be able to pay for the job is by selling the biochip that we're being hired to steal for her. Evelyn is shifty and seeks to do backroom deals to maximize what she can make. She was initially hired to scroll a BD of Arasaka's penthouse suite, but decided to plan this heist on her own without the consent or knowledge of her backers. She also propositions us to cut Dexter Deshaun out of the current deal. V, do this job for me. I mean me alone. No splitting the payout with anyone else. No middlemen. No Dex. You want to fuck over our fixer? I knew something was up. Dex is a middleman. And a useless one at this point. Evelyn, you don't mess with fixers. That's the one rule every merc in this city knows and actually follows. But if we're smart... Doesn't matter. A mistake like that'll cost you your rep. And without a rep, you're nobody. This opportunistic and calculating attitude could have put Evelyn in the money, 
but instead it ends up being her downfall. But she's really not so different from Dex or Jackie or V. Everyone is doing a bit of posturing and punching above their weight, trying to reach for riches and glory in the dystopian environment of Night City. By the end of Act 1, everyone connected to the biochip heist will be dead or in dire straits. T-Bug gets fried on the net, Jackie succumbs to injuries sustained during the heist, V gets shot in the head, Dexter Deshawn also gets shot in the head, even Evelyn meets her demise. I also love the way that CD Projekt Red builds tension and drama into these early game missions, particularly the pickup and the heist. Dex sends us to pick up a drone he purchased from the local Maelstrom gang. These guys are drugged up, ogged out, and armed to the teeth. The writing for this scene is great. The scene builds up tension in the way these guys look and the way Jackie is acting. You know this deal is not going to be a simple pickup. Make me. Thought you'd never ask. Sit your ass down for a planet Jack, of your sit down. This ain't gonna end well, but... Shit. Well, all right. Come on. Gotta lighten up. Take a hit. You're either about to get robbed or shot at or both. I decided to work with the corporate lady, Meredith Stout, who provided a cred chip for us to buy the drone, which of course was a setup. Shit! Shit, shit, shit! The heist is also well set up. Jackie is a chatterbox, which covers up the fact that he's nervous as hell walking into this hotel to clep the biochip. Quaint, cozy. Not like the hotel we had in Zurich for that convention. Don't need that, Jack. Enough. What? Taking this seriously. Things go really smoothly at first, and you might even start to think that the heist is going to go off without a hitch. But alas, it doesn't. Things go to complete shit when the Arasaka boys roll up to the suite before you can escape. T Bug dies, then Jackie dies leaving it up to you to slot in the biochip. Then Dex betrays you and shoots you in the head. No blaze of glory for me. At the end of Act 1, we're introduced to Johnny Silverhand, the rebellious rocker who bombed Arasaka Tower 50 years prior. He's the guy we slotted into our head at the end of the botched heist. V somehow survives the gunshot from Dex and gets pulled out of the ditch by Arasaka's bodyguard, Takamura. We get attacked on the road and wake up later in Vic's Ripper Doc clinic where he delivers the bad news. The biochip, it's basically a bomb. Fuse lit already. You don't have much time left. Much... life. A few weeks tops. Silverhand's construct is overriding your consciousness. Gradually taking over your body until... one day you'll just be... gone. After a quick nap, we finally come face to face with our new homeboy, Silverhand, who is living rent-free in V's head. This is one of my favorite scenes in the game. Who you work for, start talking. Fuck. Fuck. Fucking chip. Rip the thing out myself. No, wait! Johnny's antagonistic attitude shows that Vic wasn't kidding. V is merely weeks away from being erased by Silverhand. I'll take control. I'll find a way. You hear me? 
Now the goal has shifted from getting rich to finding anyone who could potentially save V's life before the biochip completely guts her mind. We meet with Takamura in a diner and talk about two options for proceeding. Evelyn Parker and Anders Hellman, inventor of the biochip. Takamura will also devise a plan to get in touch with Arasapuka's top brass later as well. This is where the game really opens up. We're finally able to explore the whole map, and we have multiple main missions to pursue, as well as some interesting side quest chains that will pop up as we go along. Based on recommended difficulty, most players will probably pursue Evelyn Parker first, at least that's what I did. We link up with her friend Judy Alvarez, who is also looking for Evelyn since she recently disappeared. Turns out that Evelyn got on the wrong side of her employers by devising the heist to steal the biochip, which had been their target. They retaliated by frying her cyberware while she was back working as a sex worker. The head of Cloud's dollhouse basically tossed her out to a shady ripper dock before she was sold to scavers. This whole quest chain has us dealing with the shadiest and shittiest people in Night City in an attempt to rescue Evelyn, all in a vague hope she might be able to help us out. Judy and V eventually track Evelyn down in a warehouse where these scumbags record snuff films. Evelyn is thankfully alive, but in really bad shape. Certainly no shape to be able to help us out. But we're able to glean some information from a couple of BDs that Judy managed to pull for us. This information leads us to the Voodoo Boys in Pacifica, the people who hired Evelyn to scroll a BD of Arasaka's penthouse suite. It was their plan to initially steal the Silverhand biochip. Pacifica was a major focus in the marketing material for Cyberpunk 2077. The neighborhood was planned as a Vegas-like playground for the ultra-wealthy, but it remained unfinished. It's since become one of the most violent and lawless parts of Night City, a place where even the police refused to go. I didn't notice any major gameplay shifts while moving through Pacifica. I expected to run into more gang patrols and get attacked on the streets more, but honestly, it seemed like any of the other neighborhoods, albeit a bit more run down aesthetically. We take a job with the Voodoo Boys in an attempt to meet their leader and gain more information about the chip. The gig ends up being a suicide mission to take out a Netrunner, who had become a major thorn in the side of the Voodoo Boys. I felt like a badass rolling back into the Voodoo Boys compound like, Remember me, motherfucker? Placide, where is the bastard? Up this day. At this point, we still need each other, though. The Voodoo Boys want the chip, or at least the data on it, and V wants a way to remove it without dying. So we agreed to jack into cyberspace to allow the Voodoo Boys to analyze the biochip and get in touch with Alt Cunningham. Again, I love how CDPR sets the scene here. The dark environments, the light around the ice bath, the standoffishness of Brigitte, the music, it all sets this ominous tone for V's dive into cyberspace. <sighs> Let's do this. <laughs> okay. What now? Johnny? Mi pare. Pare plonger. I also think the concept of the black wall is fascinating. A cordoned off part of cyberspace aimed at to keep super AIs from seizing control of the net. I hope the themes of artificial intelligence get explored further in DLC and future installments of this franchise. Within the deep net, we get another Johnny Silverhand memory that shows the personal stakes of his conflict with Arasaka. Maybe it isn't just pure anti-corporate morals that drove Johnny, but the loss of a loved one at the hands of Sokka. Alt fled into the net. When'd you find out? When she made contact a little later. And? What did she say? That she was a captive in the Arasaka subnet. But they couldn't hurt her. And she told me not to come looking for her. What? 
Why? This one time, she wanted me to just let it go. Because enough people had died for nothing already. So, what did you do? Got my hands on two thermonuclear charges. Then headed back to Arasaka Tower. One of my favorite parts of this game is the relationship between V and Johnny Silverhand. You can choose to roleplay as someone who sees him as a parasite and wants nothing more than to get him out of your head. Or you can roleplay as a V who grows closer with him and develops a more symbiotic relationship with Johnny or even a friendship. I decided to go the latter route with my character. Why are you giving me these? Imagine we're deployed together, fighting in a war, side by side. Would you take a bullet for me? I would. Yeah. Tags belong to a man who sacrificed his life for mine in Mexico. Been thinking about our predicament. Want to be clear, I will do you no wrong. When the time comes, it'll be my life for yours. I'll agree to get wiped. Tags are proof of my promise. I... I... do the same for you. Yeah. Thanks. If you play Johnny's side missions, you also have the opportunity to shape his personality as well. Do you choose to have him be the same self-centered asshole from 50 years ago? Or do you choose to have him change and show a different side of himself to Rogue and the others? This made a big impact on how I viewed my choices for the ending. The other main missions in Act 2 are fun, but didn't quite grab me as much as the storyline with Evelyn, the Voodoo Boys, and Alt Cunningham did. We link up with Johnny's old friend Rogue, who is now one of the biggest fixers in Night City and nicknamed Queen of the Afterlife. She connects us with the nomad Pan Am Palmer, who helps us take out the Corpo AV carrying Anders Hellman, inventor of the Silverhand biochip. He has nothing to offer us except the blueprints, so we send him off with Takamura and go on our own way. The last mission chain in Act 2 involves helping Takamura get in touch with Yorinobu Arasaka's sister, Hanako. He hopes to show her that Yorinobu killed his father. He promises that she will help us with the biochip if we help her oust Yorinobu and bring him to justice. These missions were intense, gameplay-wise, but I felt less connected to them because I knew I wasn't going to pursue the Arasaka route on this playthrough. I'm playing a Corpo character now on my second playthrough, so I'm curious to see how that plays out. Overall, role-playing in this game was kind of strange, to be honest. V is not a complete blank slate like you would get in an Elder Scrolls game. She's also not a defined character like Geralt of Rivia or Adam Jensen in the Deus Ex. I think the closest parallel would be Commander Shepard in the Mass Effect trilogy. The dialogue options are fairly limited. You can generally choose a tone that is either more cooperative and inquisitive or combative and standoffish. There isn't much beyond that. The life path options add a little bit more flavor, but not much else. What you blowing? Escape. Pure as baby powder. Skill check dialogues are generally just there for flavor as well. Death's head will cost you though. How about a discount for your newest customer? Only give regulars discounts. If you're short, then fuck off. Still, I felt very satisfied with the version of V I was able to create during this playthrough. A street kid with dreams of being a legend. A charming woman with a silver tongue and street smarts who won't let people walk all over her and doesn't back down from a challenge. She feels a connection and similarity to Johnny Silverhand and grows to trust him over time, which culminates in the path she chose for the ending. Things come to a head at the beginning of Act 3. After meeting with Hanako and hearing her offer, V collapses and wakes up at Vic's clinic. Her condition has reached a critical stage and she has to choose a path to resolve the biochip problem or else she will soon die. There are three different paths you can choose to go down. You can turn over the reins to Johnny, he will get in touch with Rogue, infiltrate Sokka Tower, and connect Alt Cunningham to Mikoshi. The second option is you can accept Hanako's offer and cooperate with Arasaka. 
And your third option is to contact Pan Am and accept the Alda Caldo's help. I decided to choose the path I felt best fit my character and said, Johnny, take the wheel. I think you ought to go with Rogue. Two of you together got the best shot. You absolutely sure? No going back on this, you know. You're up, Johnny. I trust you. Take the wheel. Just go easy on us, yeah? Thanks, V. I'll get us through this. You'll see. See you on the other side. That's right. Even if I gotta burn this whole fucking city down. If you haven't seen this ending yet, I recommend skipping ahead to the side quest section now, timestamp on the screen and in the description, because it really is worth experiencing for yourself. Johnny gets in touch with Rogue and puts together a team to infiltrate Arasaka Tower, just like old times. The final mission of this game is great. Working with Rogue gives us access to some of the best gear in the game, and it feels totally badass to drop into Arasaka Tower again. The first part has us sneaking through foliage to rescue our pilot. This brought back memories of playing Crisis. The next sections aren't really possible to stealth through as far as I could tell. We jump down the center of the tower with our grav boots and start gunning our way through Saka guards en route to Makoshi. Things go to shit when we run into Adam Smasher, the guy who basically killed Johnny 50 years earlier. This time he kills Rogue in front of us, and then we square off with him in a final boss fight. I haven't touched on this yet, but the boss fights in this game are kind of shitty. You basically just have to kite around the arena while unloading into the spongiest bullet sponges you'll ever fight. It's basically shoot, run, shoot, use health consumables, shoot, run, repeat until they die. The Smasher fight was a little better because we at least finally can do some damage with our high-powered weapons at this point in the game. Once Smasher is defeated, we connect Alt Cunningham to, with Mikoshi. Unfortunately, Alt was not the silver bullet solution after all. So we at the finish line? It's all in Alt's hands now. No. What the hell? Alt? I made a mistake in excluding the body as a factor. DNA reconfiguration has progressed too far. Added to aggressive, invasive medications, the body's immune system attacking its own neurons. Spit it out! In human terms! V will die independent of what I do. This is inevitable. This is imminent. For fuck's sake, Alt. You had one job and you fucked it up? I could not know the situation before conducting a thorough and precise diagnosis. You promised this poor little shit a new life! And you lied! You fucking lied! Shut it for two seconds, will ya? She is not able to save V. Her organic mind has deteriorated too much to live independently of the biochip. Now we're faced with the final decision of the game. And this time it's Johnny making the decision instead of V. Alt, give us a What the hell for? So you could trick me into agreeing. I'm giving you a free pass, even though you can already do what you want with my body. You're my friend, V. I'd never pull that on you. Never do you wrong. Seeing as how I'm doomed to die, we stick to the plan I gave you. I leave, you stay. Keys to my body are yours. No. It's gonna be me. You lying sack of shit. So what do I do, Walt? Simply cross the bridge. You will become a part of me, as V's body and former life are restored. I felt like Johnny had truly changed in my playthrough, so he stuck to his word and gave V her body back despite her pleading him not to. Unfortunately, this doesn't really solve the problem. We're treated to a scene of V in a swanky penthouse suite several weeks later. She's still coughing up blood and it's clear that she's still dying. 
She's also grown distant with Judy, who tells us that she is leaving Night City to find herself. The final scenes of this game show V taking a suicide mission into outer space of all places. A bittersweet end to a phenomenal story. This ending really bummed me out, but it seemed appropriate for this path. Placing our bets on Johnny and Alt was a long shot. First, to survive the suicide mission into Arasaka Tower, and second, to hope that Alt would even be able to help us with the biochip, which she wasn't able to do after all. We beat the odds and stuck it to Arasaka, but V still lost it all in the end. She lost Johnny, who she had grown close with, she lost her partner Judy, and most likely her own life in the end. I'm looking forward to exploring the other endings in subsequent playthroughs, and I'm curious to see if there are any that are happier than this one. Before I wrap up this video, I just wanted to quickly point out some of my favorite side quests in Cyberpunk 2077. I'm not going to go super in depth for these because I plan to do separate videos on each one, but suffice it to say Cyberpunk 2077 has some of the best side quests I've ever played in an RPG. Now this isn't true for all of the side content in the game, because there is a lot of cookie cutter fetch and kill quests, but there are some great stories as well, and that's what I'm choosing to focus on. The best side quests in my opinion are the ones involving Joshua Stevenson and the Passion of the Christ BD. That quest chain was absolutely wild. I also found the quests involving the Pervales family super intense and crazy, particularly towards the end when you start to unravel what's really happening with them. The Delamain side quests were also super interesting and had me grappling with the age old question of sentient AIs. Do they deserve self-determination? Are they truly alive, or just simply lines of code that you can reprogram or reset? The ending choices and outcomes were fascinating. I also really enjoyed all the side quests involving River Ward's investigations. There were some other notable quest chains involving Judy and the Clouds dolls, as well as Pan Am and the Aldecaldos, but those ones didn't resonate with me quite as much as the others I mentioned. And that's the story of Cyberpunk 2077. What did you think of the game? Let me know some of your favorite moments in the comments below. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to Big Dan Gaming for more cyberpunk and RPG videos. Until next time, this has been Big Dan. See ya! Come with us. You'll find out all you need to know on the way. Got to object, strongly. Noted. But you don't have a vote here. Ha! <laughs> That's it. Got no fucking idea what this is about. But if you don't go with them, I'm never talking to you again. All right, I'll go with you.